Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Friends, welcome back to this uh, lecture number 7 on the course on the psychology of language. This course as I said will focus on the psychological aspects of language. So, before we go into today's lecture which is a very interesting lecture, we will do a quick recap of what we have done in the previous lectures. So, summing it up we started off by defining what is language and what is the need for language. So, uh, the main issues that we dealt is what should we call as language and what is the difference between communication and language and there what we saw is the very basic language which can be analyzed or which can be studied is the animal communication system. So, we started off by looking at the animal communication system and finding out its uh, basic features. We saw why animals communicate and we also saw features of the animal communication system. We use several models like the honey bee or the barefoot monkey and we saw how these organisms or animals use the most primitive form of language. We moved further to looking at what is human language and how human language is different from the animal language system. We looked at characteristics of the human language system. We looked at the structure of the human language system which is in terms of the basic speech sound which are called the phones and then moving up to form the morphemes, the word, the sentence, the structure of the sentence that is the syntax and the rules of forming a sentence which is the grammar and the semantics of a sentence which is the meaning of it and from there on discourse. We then looked at how language evolved, the human language evolved and we, so we looked at the continuity and the discontinuity theories of language evolution. We also went down the memory lane and looked at how the proto language which was used by our great 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 grandfathers, how that developed into first the pidgin which is an evidence of how language developed and then the present form of language. So, in the first section itself we covered a little bit about what is language, how it is uh, to be defined, what is the nature of it and what is the structure and meaning of language. Then we proceeded on to studying the research methodology which is used in studying of language in, gen in specific and behavioral sciences in general. So, we looked at how do we do research, we defined something called the research cycle for doing uh, research in language and what this research cycle comprises of is how a theory a body of knowledge produces certain hypothesis and how this hypothesis through a method of deduction is tested through certain observations and how these observations through the process of induction leads to certain patterns or certain uh, results which either falsify the theory or support it in some way. So, we looked at the whole process of how the hypothesis is formed, the problems and uh, statement is generated and how it is tested. We looked at how modeling is done, how models are used to create this uh, observations or get observations from hypotheses. 
then we looked at experimental design which is plainly speaking the plan of doing a particular experiment. So, we looked at something called the within group and between group design and in, and in more detail other designs if you refer to that section come to know more about what we did there. Then we looked at what are the two measures which are used in language studies in the laboratory and we focused on latency which is also called a reaction time or how quickly a particular response is generated and the accuracy which is how correct a response particular response is to a language related stimuli. So, we focused on to that and then we described several experiments to show you how studies in language are done. We at the end of it we describe certain brain areas and neuroimaging techniques which are used in studies of language. The last two lectures which is lecture number 5 and 6 we actually started venturing into the language dimension. And so, as it is very natural while taking a course in language we started studying how speech is produced or how speech is perceived how do we hear. And so, there we looked at the way speech is transmitted and it is perceived. So, speech perception we looked at how speech sounds have amplitude and frequency and the fundamental frequency and the overtones and how these things are measured. We then looked into detail the way in which the auditory system is made and how the auditory system has the basilar membrane in the cochlea which is arranged or the uh, hair cells in the basilar membrane which is arranged in a tonotropic manner and how they perceive speech sounds or these speech uh, waves as I would say and then make meaning of it or transmit these, uh, these sound waves into electrical impulses or convert these sound waves into electrical impulses and then transport uh, transmit it to something called the primary auditory area from where uh, there it is sent to the secondary auditory area where speech perception or meaning is extracted from speech sounds. We looked at how the speech stream is made in terms of the spectrograph. We looked at how consonants and vowels are perceived and how speech despite the fact that it looks non-continuous is continuous in nature. We looked at other, uh, several other properties of speech for example, how uh, uh, the form and the fricatives, the plosives uh, and, and uh, these kind of sorents, these kind of features of the speech sound is, uh, is ex expressed and what do they mean in detail. We looked at the idea of how humans perceive speech sound through categorical perception and we looked at the phoneme restoration effect which is a statement or an evidence of the categorical perception of the speech sound. Towards the end we looked at the development of speech perception in children, how children develop speech perception and there the most important point that we looked at is the way the mother or the child uh, the caregiver talks to the child that is the most important way the child perceives the speech stream. So, we looked at various uh, details of that and we also looked at how children develop these speech streams or children develop this idea of the speech stream how they perceive it and how they uh, understand word boundaries or 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 clause or, or uh, uh, boundaries of certain clauses which are there and uh, how do they actually perceive the speech. Lastly, we looked at several theories of speech perception. We started with the motor theory which emphasizes the fact that the vocal cord movement is what is responsible for the speech. Then we looked at and, and they also propose the speech is special. We looked at the general auditory framework which says that speech is not special and it is as similar to auditory perception and they gave several evidences for that. And last we looked at uh, we looked at the relativistic dualism uh, the, the principle of uh, uh, direct realism I am sorry and how this direct realism 
proposes that speech which comes to us, the speech sound which comes to us carries all the necessary information and we do not need to use any special mechanisms for perceiving speech. And uh, they provided or they used the mirror neurons as the evidence, the biological evidence for the fact that speech which, which the uh, humans here it contains all the necessary information for decoding it. So, that is where we ended the uh, last class. What we are going to do today is we are going to look at how the speech is produced. Now, in the last class we looked at how speech is perceived, in today's class we will look into how speech is produced. So, we will do an uh, analysis or we will do a detailed study of the vocal apparatus, the vocal cord, the glottis, the vocal uh, box and the mouth itself and how these speech sounds are produced in itself. And that is the role or that is the main issue in this and the next lecture which is supposed to follow. So, let us start by looking at how humans produce speech. Now, the humans uh, they talk to each other and sometimes when they are alone they even talk to themselves. But then this how this talking is, is developed or how this talking takes place, the sound is produced that is of interest. So, let us look at the vocal tract and the speech perception. So, humans they do a very good job by blowing air out of the mouth, they communicate complex thoughts to other member of the species. So, by just blowing some air out of their vocal cord, they are able to produce certain sounds and these sounds can communicate information between different people. Now, speech production generally begins in the lungs from where the air stream flows up the trachea to the glottis or the voice box. So, right at the lungs the air stream starts and then it moves up to the trachea through the trachea to the glottis which is called the voice box. Now, the vocal folds consist of, so the trachea or the vocal uh, the vocal tract has something called vocal folds. Now, these vocal folds they consist of pairs of membranes which are stretched across the opening of the glottis. So, if this is my glottis the vocal folds are stretched across the glottis that can be vibrated to produce sound. So, these vocal uh, folds they receive air through the trachea and these air they make a vibration in this vocal folds and this vibration is what you hear as sound. Now, when the vocal folds are retracted back, they are not open, the air stream flows, flows uninterrupted and it is breathing. So, when it is stretched to the glottis, the voice box, you hear speech and when it is retracted back, what you hear is the speech sound. So, the same apparatus which is used for breathing is also used for producing uh, sound or producing uh, uh, the speech stream. Now, the vocal tract generally speaking it consists of the oral and the nasal cavities. So, you have the oral cavity in the vocal tract and you also have the nasal cavity in the oral tract and they serve as resonating chambers for the phonation produced by the vibrations of the vocal cord. So, the resonation that happens of the stream of air which passes through the vocal tract it happens either in the vocal cavity which is here or in the nasal cavity and so that leads to the phonation. So, phonation is the sound which is produced by the vibration of the vocal cord that is that is what is called phonation and so there are two tracks which are used there are two cavities which are used one is the nasal cavity the other is the vocal cavity. So, vocal tract as you can see the open cavities of throat mouth and nose above the vocal folds and regions where the speech sounds are produced. So, that is what the vocal tract is and the vocal folds these are pair of membranes stretched across opening of the glottis which is the voice box and can be vibrated to produce sound. What is phonation? These are sound produced by vibrations of the vocal fold as air from the lungs are passed through them that is what we have discussed and this air is the primary material for speech sounds. Now, in the English language vowels are generally produced by directing the air flow to the mouth producing resonation in the uh, oral cavity. So, basically in English the vowels are produced by unimpeded movement of the air out of the 
mouth uh, uh, by uh, and the resonating in the oral cavity. In comparison, the consonants are produced by restricting the air flow. The vocal tract itself is shaped as like an inverted saxophone. If you have ever seen a saxophone, if you invert the saxophone, so the big, uh, this is how my saxophone actually looks like. This is my reed, this is my uh, place from where this is, this is my tube and by constricting, by making the tube or changing the, the structure of the tube, a sound is produced. So, if I invert this, this is, if I invert this figure and it goes like this to this, this is how my Uh, vocal tract will actually look like. So, it, it looks like an inverted saxophone with the vocal folds acting as the reed and the oral and nas nasal cavities as the resonating tube. So, this is my oral and na uh, nasal cavities and the vocal tract which is this is this part of it, it is called the reed. <coughs> Beside this, the tongue, jaw and lips can be used to change the shape and size of the oral cavity. So, the tongue, the jaw and the lips can all work together and they can change the, uh, the size of the oral cavity and produce different consonants or uh, in, in, uh, in the English language. Now, the tongue, teeth and lips, so the tongue, the teeth and the lips can also block or constrict the air flow. Now, before this, we were talking about vowels where unimpeded air moves through the vocal tract and in the resonate in the oral cavity and come out of it. So, if you are not restricting the air, it is a vowel, but if there is a restriction, so a restriction in terms of either the tongue or the teeth or the lips, they block or constrict the air flow and influence the quality of the sound. So, that also this constriction also leads, leads to the production of consonant. Now, the fleshy region of the mouth covering the bone where the upper teeth is anchored is called the alveolar the, uh, the alveolar ridge. So, this is my alveolar ridge, it is the upper teeth and so this hard thing here is called the alveolar ridge and it is important for consonant production. So, this is important for the, al the alveolar ridge is important for consonant production. Now, behind the alveolar ridge, the bony region along the roof of the mouth, so this region which is right here along the roof of the mouth is called the hard palate. So, this is my alveolar region and this is my hard palate and both of them are important for producing the consonant sound. So, vowels are produced by uninterrupted passage of the air from the vocal stream into the oral cavity and uh, that is how the uh, vowel is produced. Now, how is a consonant produced? The consonants they are produced by obstructing the air flow through the oral cavity. So, this is uh, my uh, vowel. So, I have the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. These are the two places uh, where uh, you generally see uh, the resonation happening uh, in, in terms of vowel production or the air which comes out of the, uh, the, the tract, the vocal tract, it resonates in two places, either it is a nasal cavity, so resonation produced in the nasal consonants like M, N, twing and some vowels which are there. So, you have either the M or N which is in terms of consonants or the twang of some vowels are also produced here. In the oral cavity, most speech sounds produced inside the mouth. What is the uh, alveolar ridge, it is a flashy region behind the upper teeth. So, this region and the hard palate is a bony region along the roof of the mouth, so inside and velum is a soft palate which is a flashy region behind the hard palate. So, this region is called the velum. So, this is a, a, a quick diagram of uh, the uh, vocal system and you can see these are the vocal folds this is my tongue, this is my jaw and so jaw movement is also important in producing consonants, uh, the tongue is also important in producing consonants. So, these are not important in producing vowels, but they are important in producing consonants. You have the lips, you have the alveolar ridge, you have the nasal cavity here, this is the hard palate, this region, this is the velum and this is the oral cavity. So, this in total is what is the uh, vocal tract actually 
looks like. Now, we have looked at how uh, uh, the vowels are produced, let us look at consonants. So, as I said consonants are produced by obstructing the flow of air through the oral cavity. So, if I obstruct the air, <coughs> if the air which is coming out of the vocal cavity is not obstructed, it is basically vowel. But if it is constructed in some way, it is blocked in some way, you actually produce or what is produced out of that is something called a consonant. Now, there are three factors which determine consonant uh, quality. So, the consonants they depend on three factors or there are three different types of uh, mechanisms for producing the consonant. The first is or the quality of the consonant. The first is called the place of articulation, second is the manner of articulation and third is the voicing or the voice onset time. So, place of articulation, uh, what role does it has? The place of articulation as you say as you see here describes the uh, location along the vocal tract where the obstruction occurs to produce the consonant. So, where is the obstruction? The place of articulation defines the <coughs> obstruction, the place of obstruction of the airstream which is coming from the vocal cord and that defines what consonant will actually be produced. So, locations in oral cavity where air flow is obstructed to produce consonant. So, important places of articulation, the most important place of articulation are the lips. So, you have lips you have the teeth, the alveolar ridge, the hard pellet and the, so these are the places where the obstruction can actually happen. Now, consonant sound that is produced by bringing the upper and the lower lips together is called a bilabial. Uh, consonant. So, bilabial which is produced by bringing upper and lower lips together. In English you have, so example uh, uh, you have pe, be, me and in Japanese you have fuji, in Spanish you have the voca. Now, uh, you have to purse your lips before you let go of the air. So, do that and, and uh, that is how you do. So, purse your lips before you let go of air and see what it produces, it produces a P sound and this is called the bilabial. So, this is like this, P, the sound that you hear, this is the P sound. So, P as in P, B as in B and M as in may. these are the bilabial consonant. So, upper lips, uh, both the lips together, uh, when it is used for construction, the bilabial consonant is produced. Now, consonant that is produced by bringing the upper lip, bringing the lower lip against the upper teeth is the labio dental consonant. So, it is produced by bringing the lower lip against the upper teeth, right. For example, few, try saying few. So, this this lip goes and attaches itself or constricts to the teeth and so you produce the f in few and v in view. So, few. Then a consonant which is produced by protruding the trunk between the upper and lower teeth is called the intradental. So, intradental consonants are those which are produced by protruding the tongue between the upper and the lower teeth. For example, thai and thai, thai and thai. What you are doing is you are protruding the tongue between the upper and the lower teeth and that is how it is producing. So, thai, thai or thai. So, if you can try this, you can place the blade of the tongue against the upper teeth and let some air come uh, hissing. So, uh, when I do that, I get the th sound. The So, this is my tongue, place it against the upper teeth and let some air out of it. The sound that you get is the th th sound. Now, a consonant which is produced by pressing the lip of the tongue against the fleshy area behind the upper teeth is the l alveolar consonant. So, what is the alveolar consonant? These are produced by pressing the tip of the tongue against the alveolar ridge like this. So, I get new, new, dew, try saying it, this tongue will press against the alveolar 
region and that is how you produce this sound. So, saying nu, du, tu, zu, su all of them require you to press the tip of the tongue against the alveolar ridge which is just behind the upper teeth. Now, a consonant which is produced by pressing the blade of the tongue against the region between the alveolar ridge and the hard palate is called the post alveolar. So, post alveolar consonants what are they? They are produced by pressing the blade of the tongue against regions between the alveolar ridge and the hard palate. So, this is my hard palate and this is my alveolar ridge this area and hard palate this area and by placing the blade of the tongue against this between these two right here is what you get for example, for example try saying jin jin the moment you say that the blade of the tongue gets in between the alveolar ridge and the hard palate or shin 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 also z sound the z h sound in version version that's how this particular post alveolar sound is or post alveolar consonant is produced now the consonants which are produced by pressing the root of the tongue against the soft palate this region against the back of the mouth are referred to as the velar so velar are those consonants which are produced by pressing the root of the tongue so this is my root so if i press the root of the tongue against the soft palate which is somewhere here inside against the back of the mouth the sounds which are produced or the consonants which are produced in that way is what are called the velar consonants. So, produced by pressing the root of the tongue against the soft palate for example, gu, ku, the ng sound in sing, wing that kind of sound which are produced and so that are called the velar consonants. Now, also I have the glottal consonants. So, what are the glottal, glottal consonants then? These are produced by so the, the glottis which is the wise box which houses the vocal fold can be used to make consonant sounds. So, they, this can also be used to make the consonant sounds. The H sound in English is essentially a voiceless A. Ah, so, H is actually a voiceless A H sound that you get. Now, alternating between H and A one finds the vocal fall vibrate for a a and not for h. So, if you alternate between h, 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 h and a a a a a, you will see that for a a a there is a um, vibration of the vocal cord. So, when you say a a a, but when you say h, 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 there is no vibration of the vocal cord and so this is the h sound is the wiseless a h sound. So, glottal these are produced by constricting the vocal fo uh, fold. Now, English a the middle sound in Oh, oh, ho, or mm -hmm is the called the glottal stop sound. The glottal stop is a consonant which is produced by constricting the vocal fold. Now, if you try constricting the vocal fold, the sounds which are produced by constricting the vocal fold is what is called the glottal stop, uh, uh, glottal stop consonant. And so, these are produced in examples. So, examples of these are uh, the middle of uh, the sound in the expression oh, ho, or the Mm -hmm. the middle of that mm -hmm, that that you produce is basically the glottal swap sound and this is produced by constricting the vocal folds. So, this is all about the plays of articulation and how they produce consonants. Another way in which consonants can be produced is by the manner of articulation which is how we restrict the uh, stream of air which is coming from the vocal tract. So, manner of articulation they describe the degree to which the airflow is obstructed in the producing a <coughs> consonant. So, the degree to which the airflow is obstructed is the definition of the manner of articulation of producing the uh, consonant. So, manner of articulation degree to which airflow is obstructed in production of the consonant. The obstruction can involve a complete stop. So, this the manner of articulation could be a complete stop a constriction or a diversion of the airstream. So, it could be a complete stop, it could be a 
constriction or uh, uh, some kind of constriction. So, stopping it in some way or it could be a total diversion of the air stream. Now, plosive is a consonant. So, uh, you could have nasal produced by blocking oral cavity releasing airflow through the nasal sounds and final sounds in English for example. So, you could have also use the nasal uh, stream or the, no, the, the nasal cavity call also be produced it can be a manner of articulation. And so, uh, final sounds in English for example, some or sun or sung uses the na nasal cavity. Now, the plosal uh, the plosives is a consonant which is produced by momentarily stopping and then releasing the air flow. So, if we uh, do this momentary stop total stop of the air flow and then release it the consonant which is produced are called the plosives. For example, the B, D, G or the P, T, K are those kinds of consonants. So, plosive is the stop consonant these are produced by blocking and then releasing the air flow in the oral cavity. English bat, pat, dew, to, gill, kill all of these when we are producing that what is happening is I am temporarily blocking the air flow and then letting it go and because of that I am able to produce the B in bat, bat. So, somewhere I am constricting and letting it go. Now, consonant which is produced by passing an air flow a consonant that is produced by momentarily blocking the air flow and then releasing it through a light constriction. So, momentarily blocking it and then releasing it through a light constriction. So, small constriction is made think of it as a uh, uh, as a hose pipe with water. So, you block it with your thumb and then lightly release the water that is the same situation here and that is a constriction is called the affricate. This is what my affricate is all about. So, produced by momentary blocking air flow and then releasing it through a tight constriction. So, take the thumb, take a hose pipe with water, take the thumb and totally block it and then release it partially <laughs> through a uh, narrow constriction. This is what my affricate, this is what my uh, or this is how the affricates are produced and the English gin and chin are called the affricates. Similarly, you have the fricative, affricate or the, you have the fricative and so how are the fricative, fricative produced? A consonant which is produced by passing the air flow through a constriction in the oral cavity is a fricative. So, these are produced by restricting oral cavity to create friction. So, you create you restrict the oral cavity. So, a friction happens and when you do that the consonants which are produced out of it is what is called the uh, fricatives and what are they? The English view. So, when you say view what you are doing is uh, you are restricting the oral cavity. So, a friction is produced to produce V in view, F in few, T in thigh, TH in thigh, Z in zoo, S in zoo, V in version and V in virgin. So, when you say view, few, die, thigh, zoo, what you are doing ex especially the word zoo, when you do that you can hear the friction which is happening or sue, sue. This when you say that that what is happening is there is a uh, <coughs> fiction which is uh, being happening at the uh, vocal cord because you have restricted the airflow and the, the consonants which are produced out of it is what is called fricative. There is also something called the uh, approximant. What is the approximant? Now, the approximants are is a consonant which is produced by diverting the airflow without constricting it. So, if you divert the airflow without constricting it what you get is the approximant and what is the approximant? Approximants are L, R, Y and W sounds for example, in English the ye when you say ye, we, re, le what you are doing is you are not constricting the airflow which is coming from uh, the, the vocal cord, but you are diverting the airflow in some way and that is how you say re and le the L word, the R word, the Y word and the W word are or these consonants are what are called the, uh, the approximant. Now, approximants are produced without turbulence to the air stream. So, these approximants since they are produced by <coughs> uh, turbulence in the air stream and since they are not produced by restricting the airflow, so sometimes they are also called as the semi vowels. So, semi vowels are equivalent to what the approximants are and also consonants are produced by voicing for example, early or late voice onset time 
So, you can have the voice consonants with the early voice onset time. So, voice onset time is the uh, way the, the sound is produced and the vibrations, the, uh, the difference between or the time difference between the vibration of the vocal cord and the actual production of the sound from the, the oral cavity that is called voice. So, in voice you have the early VOT for example, English boo, do and go and in voiceless you have the late VOT voice onset time. So, there is a delay in, in the production of the sound from the vocal uh, from the oral cavity and the vocal vibrations and uh, if this is less it is called the white, uh, voiceless and the B, T and key in English are voiceless. So, this is how the consonants are produced. So, you have the manner of uh, articulation, the place of articulation and the <coughs> voicing which is the timing difference between the oral cavity production and the vibration of the vocal fold. So, this is how consonants are produced. Now, let us take a look at how vowels are produced. So, before that this is the inventory that you can see the manner, the nasal, plosive, plosive, affricate, affricate, fricate, fricative, approximate and lateral. And if you can see it is voice, <coughs> voicing, voice, voiceless. In terms of it is the labial, the labiodental, the intradental, the alveolar, the post alveolar, the palatal, the velar and the glottal. And as you can see there is a so small chart which describes how the consonants are produced. Now, just like the consonants, the vowels are also produced or how are the vowels produced that is also interesting to see. So, vowels are produced by modifying the shape of the oral cavity. Now, in consonants I restrict the sound which is coming from the oral cavity or from the vocal folds either in the oral cavity or in the nasal cavity are restricted in some way and that is how the vowels are produced. So, restriction of airstream produces consonants, but not restricting the sound produces the vowel and so how is vowels produced? They are produced by modifying the shape of the oral cavity. So, if I modify the shape of the oral cavity, I get a consonant. Now, three factors influence the shape of uh, the uh, influence the shape or the type of vowel which is produced, the height of the jaw, the position of the tongue. So, how high is the jaw that is one thing, the position of the tongue, where the tongue is and the shape of the lips. So, what is the shape of the lip? These three will actually determine what kind of vowel will be produced. So, jaws continuum for high open to low closed tongue continuum for front to back. So, front to back type of movement <coughs> open and close in terms of jaw and in lips. So, you have the jaws, the lips and the tongue these are responsible for producing the vowels. So, you have unrounded with front vowels in English, rounded with back vowels in English. Many languages use lip rounding as a separate form of tongue position. Now, before we come to this let us have a look at what this is all about. So, the jaw that, that you see this is the jaw that, that there they move up and down on a hinge. So, this is the hinge and so they move up and down. So, this is the lower jaw which actually moves and makes the uh, vowel sound. Making the oral cavity inside the mouth smaller and larger. So, the way it moves it determines the oral cavity or it determines the size of the oral cavity. The rotating jaw produces a triangular vowel space. So, the way the uh, jaw moves it determines the uh, or it makes the triangular a vowel space which we are looking at here. Now, the vowel E E is said to be high because the jaw is positioned high, closing the mouth and the vowel A H is said to be low because the jaw lowers to open the mouth. So, when I see E the jaw is high, but when I say A ah, in this the jaw comes down and so this is low, the A ah is low in terms of jaw a moment and E E is high movement of the jaw. The tongue can also move, move back and froth inside the mouth. So, it the tongue can also do this movement and that also produces vowel. So, the vowel E E is said to be front because the tongue is pushed forward in the mouth. So, when I say E E the tongue is pushed forward in the mouth and the jaw is actually high and that is how the E E sound produced. Now, while the vowel O O when I say that the tongue moves down uh, sorry the jaw moves down and the tongue is said to be back. When I say O the tongue goes inside, but when I say uh, E the tongue is moved towards the forward direction. 
because the tongue is pushed backward in the mouth. So, O O the tongue is moved backward, but when I say E E E E the tongue is moved towards the forward section. Also, this is related to the movement of the jaw also as I said there is a high jaw movement. So, when I say uh, the E E the jaw is high, but when I say A ah, the jaw is lower or O oh, the jaw is lower. Now, the three vowel sound A ah, E and O oh, A ah, E and O makes marks the extremities of the vowel space. So, this is what is called the vowel space. Now, this is the movement of the tongue from the front to the back, this is the movement of the jaw from the high to the low and this is the. So, these are the two uh, things which are there which can produce the different vowels. So, you have high in high movement of the jaw you have uh, <coughs> vowels like heed and had and in, in terms of uh, the. Um, so, if it is front unrounded lips and high jaw you produce heat, but if it is back of the uh, uh, the back of the tongue and low jaw you have the hat. So, the A and E that is how it is produced. So, A producing and E producing is dependent. So, basically the tongue, the jaw and they combine together to form something called the, uh, the, the triangular uh, vowel space. All other vowel sounds fits in between these three. So, the three vowels which is the A the E and the O mark the extremities of the vowel sound. The A, E and O are the one which marks the three extremities. With A at the bottom center, so A at the bottom center here, E at the high front, so A at the uh, sorry E E at the high front. So, this is where my E E would be, this is where my A sound is and this is where my O O sound is and so that is what it is and O at the high back. So, high back I have O O in the bottom center I have the A H and at the high front I have the E E. Now, all other vowels actually fit within these three uh, fits in between these three particular regions which have been marked on this particular triangle. Now, English has uh, one or more uh, phonemic vowels situated in the middle of the vowel space, a neutral mid central vowel occurring in many unstressed syllables in English is known as the skiva. So, skiva is another thing which is there, the a in about or sofa is a skiva sound. So, what are these? So, these are phonemic vowels which are situated in the middle of the vowel space. So, if something is situated in the middle of the vowel space, phonemic vowels, these are called the skiva sound. Now, it is a neutral mid central vowel occurring in uh, many unstressed syllables for example, the A in sofa is a vowel which is situated somewhere in the middle of this space and so that is what uh, middle of space in, in terms of both the tongue and the jaw and that is how <coughs> the vowel is produced. So, vowel space in English, the hinge opening and closing of the jaw creates a triangular vowel space, the tongue can move forward and backward within this space and the lips can be either rounded or unrounded. Also, <coughs> in addition to these. Uh, the way the lips and the jaw make the vowel, we also have something called a diphthong. Now, what is a diphthong? A diphthong is a vowel combination that is perceived as a single phoneme. So, one or two vowels or a combination of vowels when they occur together and but when they are produced <laughs> a single phone, a single speech sound that is called a diphthong. Now, English has three diphthong as in A E O A and A O. For example, high how and hoy. So, if I say hi, I have the a, a and e vowel coming in, I have the ho, h o y. So, uh, diphthongs, when I say hi, I have the vowel combination a, h and e, e, but when I say hoy, I have the vowel combination o, h and e, e, and similarly, when I say how. I have the vowel combination a, h and o, o and when I say how it is these two vowels which are combining together and that is what is called a diphthong. So, in English there are three in number also some other languages may have diphthong. So, what are diphthongs? These are combination of vowels, but they sound like a, sing, a single uh, phonemic sound. So, that brings us to the end of what the how the vowels and um, uh, 
or or the vowels and the consonants are produced. But another interesting thing is looking at the areas which process language. And so, uh, uh, the speech areas of the brain <laughs> they are define a good <coughs> thing would be to look at or study the speech areas of the brain. So, uh, according to the traditional uh, Wernicke, so as you know there is the Wernicke area and the Broca area. So, uh, Broca area is speech uh, production, but uh, speech perception is done by something called the Wernicke area in the brain. So, the Wernicke Geshwan, uh, Geshwin model, the Broca area as you know it is in the frontal lobe and speech production and uh, Wernicke area is a temporal lobe and speech perception. So, uh, what is this uh, Wernicke Geshwin model of language production is. Now, according to the Wernicke Geshwin model, Wernicke area is responsible for speech perception, the Wernicke area perceives the speech, Broca area is responsible for speech production, the Broca area produces speech and the, art, uh, the arcuate fascicles is a band of fibers which extends from the Wernicke to the Broca area uh, connects speech perception and production. The Gaskin model now since the, when the model was produced or the model was given neuroimaging techniques did not exist and so the <coughs> best possible deduction or best po uh, possible uh, theorizing was made and these are made in terms of people who suffered from several kind of aphasias either the Broca aphasia or the Wernicke aphasia and what this model says is that the Broca area is an area in the brain which helps in producing speech. So, speech producing and the Wernicke area is in the uh, is a brain area which is used for perceiving speech. So, it is a three dimensional model and the, the fiber which connects the Broca area and the Wernicke area is called the arcuate fascicles and that also leads to a kind of aphasia and this is the uh, fiber, the band of fiber which connects these two area together and that is how the model is looked at. This is what the uh, Wernicke Geshwin model of language production is. The Wernicke Geshwin model explains three common forms of aphasia. So, how it was developed? The model was developed by studying people which had certain kind of aphasias or certain kind of speech problems. Now, expressive or Broca's aphasia. Now, Broca's area came into being from idea that there are something called Broca's aphasia and what is Broca's aphasia? Broca's aphasia is a condition in which brain damage leads to loss of speech production without the loss of speech comprehension. So, people can comprehend speech, they can understand speech when they are spoken to, but then they are not able to produce speech and that is what is called the Broca area or the Broca aphasia. Similar to that, you have Wernicke or repetitive aphasia and what is this Wernicke aphasia? In this what happens is a condition in which brain damage leads to a loss of speech comprehension and fluent but meaningless speech production. So, people are able to produce speech, they produce speech perfectly, but then there is no meaning of the speech because speech comprehension is not there. And then we have something called the conduction aphasia. What is this uh, condition aphasia? It happens uh, in, in the bec uh, because of damage to the arcuate uh, fascicles is there. These are band of neural fibers extending from the temporal to the frontal lobe throughout uh, thought to connect the Wernicke area with the Broca area. And what kind of aphasia is the conduction aphasia? It happens due to this. So, you have the conduction aphasia. A language disorder characterized by perceived speech perception and production capabilities, but with a marked difficulty in repeating spoken language. So, when something is said to you, you can produce it, you can also uh, uh, understand what is being said, but if you have to repeat that word, you cannot do it and that is what is called the conduction aphasia or that is because the arcuate fasciculus that has some problem in it. So, that is how uh, the, the whole idea of uh, uh, Wernicke Geshwin model of language production has been uh, talked about. Now, so if you look into this, this is where my Wernicke area is, this is my lateral fissure, this is my Broca area, this is the motor cortex, this area is the motor cortex, Broca area, 
Wernicke, the angular gyrus which is again another region for producing speech and this is my primary visual cortex and so in a in conduction fiber which connects this and this is called the arcuate physicals which has another uh, reason or this is how the Gashwin uh, model or Gashwin uh, Wernicke uh, model is talking about. Now, Wernicke Gashwin uh, model of aphasia, you have expressive aphasia, loss of speech production without loss of speech comprehension results from damage in the Broca area, also called the Broca aphasia. You have rec uh, receptive aphasia, which is loss of speech comprehension and fluent but meaningless speech production. This is called the, uh, the receptive aphasia and results from damage to Wernicke area, also called the Wernicke's aphasia. And similarly, you have the conduction aphasia, which is preserves speech perception and production, but difficulty in reputation and it results from damage to the arcuate physicals. Now, beside the Wernicke area and, and the, uh, the Broca area and the, uh, the arcuate physicals, there are other regions of the cerebral cortex which are also responsible for um, uh, producing speech or uh, the, uh, the cerebral cortex, some of the uh, regions of the cerebral cortex which are involved in production of speech. So, let us look at uh, those regions. So, the cerebral cortex in uh, is the thin outer covering of the brain where most of the computations uh, that give rise to our conscious experience and interaction with the world takes place. So, that is what the cerebral cortex is the outer surface which is there. Now, the folding of the cerebral cortex leads to a series of ridges and furrows known as uh, loaned by the Latin term of Gyrian silicus. So, this uh, this um, cerebral cortex has some ridges which are there. So, you have some foldings in there and so these foldings are called the gyri and the silicae. The gyri is a protruding region. So, what comes out is the protruding region if you see uh, you have uh, if, if you see the cerebral cortex this is what you generally see. So, if you look into it these are the gyri and the silica. So, uh, this is what I am talking about. So, uh, that is that. So, the gyrus is a protruding region of the cerebral cortex and silica is the region of the cerebral cortex that is folded inward. So, if you look at it the inward fold is the, the silica and the protruding region is the gyrus. Now, the gyri and silica both are geographical features uh, of hills and valleys or the cortex and these are convenient landmarks to be located for locating functional regions of the brain. So, this gyri and silica actually tell you where are the functional regions of the brain. So, region of cerebral cortex that protrude outward and silicus is the region of cerebral cortex that is folded inward. Now, the temporal lo lobe exhibits three roughly horizontal gyri running in uh, the parallel named the superior medial inferior temporal gyri going from top to bottom. So, you have the superior uh, gyri, the medial and the inferior temporal gyri these are the three gyruses which are there in the temporal lobe. So, top is the temporal lobe and in that you have three gyruses which are out there. Now, Wernicke area is located in the posterior superior temporal gyri. Similarly, the frontal lobe that, that you see also has three horizontal gyri which is called the superior, the medial and the inferior frontal gyri. So, you have superior uh, gyri, the in medial gyri and the inferior gyri even in the frontal lobe. So, if it is in the temporal lobe, it is the Wernicke area definition. If it is in the frontal lobe, it is the Broca area definition. So, Broca area is in the inferior frontal gyrus. Now, the uh, frontal and parietal lobes are separated by the central silicus. So, uh, the separation of the frontal and temporal gyrus is in uh, the frontal and the parietal gyrus is, is in terms of uh, the central silicus, which is flanked by two vertical gyries known as the precentral and the postcentral gyri. The post central gyrus on the parietal side of the divide is the somatosensory cortex, the region of the brain that process uh, the body senses to keep track of what the various body parts are doing. So, you have the somatis, uh, somatosensory cortex which is the region of the brain which process, uh, uh, which, pro, uh, which looks at what various uh, regions of the brain are doing and it is in the post central gyrus and these includes the articulators for speech. So, the somatosensory cortex they, they also monitor the articulators of speech, the various uh, uh, speech producing areas or the various speech producing um, uh, apparatus which are there. Now, the precentral gyrus on the frontal side of the divide is the primary motor cortex, the region of the brain that program commands to move the body including the articulators for speech. Also, the, in the precentral gyrus, so in the postcentral gyrus you have the somatosensory cortex which are responsible for uh, uh, maintaining articulators of speech. Similarly, in the precentral gyrus you have the primary 
primary motor cortex which is also responsible for uh, uh, articulation of certain speech producing uh, uh, apparatus. Now, the deep groove separating the left and the right hemisphere is called the longitudinal fissure and in its inner surfaces are covered with cerebral cortex. So, you have <laughs> if you look at the brain uh, in between or from a front to back thing the region which separates the two brain together or uh, separate is the longitudinal fissure and it is covered by the cerebral cortex. Now, included in the regions in the supplementary motor cortex now within this you have the supplementary motor cortex which is a brain region that is believed to be responsible for programming intentional actions and opposed to response to sensory input. So, you have the uh, another interesting region which makes uh, its its uh, uh, which makes its effect on speech production is supplementary motor cortex. Now, the anterior cingulate uh, cortex regions deep inside the longitudinal fissure that is believed to be involved in error detection and, mo and monitoring conflict. So, the anterior cingulate another region in the brain which is responsible for, uh, for speech production or uh, error detection in speech production. Now, the deep fold in the cerebral cortex that separates the temporal lobe uh, from the frontal and parietal lobes is called the lateral silicus and so that is there. So, region within the lateral silicus that has been implicated in language processing is the anterior insula. So, there is something called the anterior insula which is in, in the uh, in the lateral silicus and that is also responsible for producing languages. Now, the Silvesian fissure the region inside and surrounding the lateral silicus is referred to as the pre silvian uh, cort uh, cortex and this is a busy area for language. Um, uh, production. So, you have the longitudinal fissure, the deep groove separating the left and right hemisphere, you have the lateral silicus which is uh, deep fold that separates temporal lobe from frontal and parietal lobes also called the silvesian fissure and region inside the around the <coughs> lateral silicus known as pre silvian cortex and so these are responsible for uh, uh, production of language. Also you have the somatosensory cortex which is in the parietal lobe, it is processes body senses, keeps track of what the body parts are doing and includes articulators. You have the primary motor cortex which is in the frontal lobe which programs commands and uh, body movements including the articulators. You have the primary auditory cortex which is in the temporal lobe which processes sensory input from ears including the speech and similarly you have the visual uh, primary visual cortex which is in the occipital lobe and which processes sensory input from eyes and important not only for reading but also for face to face speech perception. Supplementary motor regions are also there longitudinal fissure and programming intentional actions you have the anterior cingulate cortex which is the longitudinal fissure detecting errors and monitoring conflict and you have the anterior insula which is uh, deep within the lateral silicus and implicated in language producing. So, see these are some of the functional regions of the brain as you can see this is the auditory association area, this is the auditory cortex, the Wernicke area, the visual cortex, the visual <coughs> yeah the somatosensory area, primary sensory cortex, motor sensory cortex or the precental gyri, the premotor area, the prefrontal cortex, the Broca area and so these are the circuits which have which we have been looking at, these are the divisions which are there and so that all these areas are responsible for producing speech. And lastly, we have something called the minimum network, uh, minimal network for overt speech uh, production. Now, just like walking talking is also uh, uh, a routine activity. So, talking like walking is a rhythmic activity uh, with its repeating patterns of consonants and vowels. So, just like certain acts are done in, in walking, certain kind of movements are done in uh, walking. Similarly, certain rhythmic activity are also done in talking uh, by repeating the consonants and vowels pattern which produces a sequence of syllables. Now, it requires the executive, uh, the exquisite coordination of many muscles to move the articulators just the right amount so at the right time. So, when you talk the right kind of muscles has to be moved at the right time to produce the right amount of sound so that the vowels and consonants are produced and because of that a syllable is produced and because of that you are able to produce the sound. Now, many of the brain structures involved in controlling locomotion are also enlisted for the production of speech. Now, Rick <coughs> others 2008 have identified the minimal network for overt speech production. The network is composed of three functional systems. So, minimal speech production area as uh, produced by Ricker and others in 2008 is they say that there are three areas which are there. The network is composed of three functional systems encompassing both the cortical and subcortical structures on both sides of the brain. So, it includes both. So, these are the minimum area for speech production according to Ricker's and others. Now, there is a starting mechanism, there is a generation of phonetic plans and then there is a coordination, uh, coordination movement plan. 
So, the first functional system consists of the starting mechanisms involved initiating and maintaining uh, a continuous fluent speech stream. So, the first system is <laughs> initiating and maintaining speech, fluent speech. Supplementary motor cortex initiates speech motor movements and anterior cingulate uh, monitors for errors. The system centers on the supplementary motor cortex and anterior cingulate. The second uh, functional system uh, that is the, so this is my first functional system, this is my second functional system. The fi second functional system is composed of the premotor components that are responsible for generating phonetic plans, Broca's area and the anterior uh, uh, insula. So, you have uh, it is responsible for generating, it generates phonetic plans. So, how uh, and what to be said? You have the Broca area here, which is the anterior insula involved in pre planning of speech articulation, and primary motor cortex assembles the motor plan for articulators. And the third functional system, uh, which is out there, uh, it extends from the bilateral primary motor cortex down into a number of subcortical structures. And the system as a whole is responsible for coordinating movement. So, it is basically the third system is for movement coordination of more than 100 muscles in the respiratory tract, vocal tract and the face and are involved in production of speech stream. So, it is coordinating movement system which is the third system which is there. The motor loops between the primary motor cortex and the subcortical structure, uh, uh, structures, you have the cerebellum regulates rhythmic syllable production at normal speaking, basal ganglia which selects most appropriate motor programs in a given context and then thalamus which plays a role in coordinating motor programs for speech production. Now, beside this, one or more loops for speech production involves the cerebellum is responsible for coordinating movements. You have another motor loop speech production runs through the basal ganglia and you have the thalamus which is another subcortical structure that uh, often observed to be active during brain imaging uh, studies of speech production. So, uh, <coughs> that should bring us towards the end of this lecture. Uh, what we did in today's lecture is we started off by looking at <coughs> how the vocal tract is composed of. So, what are the parts of the vocal tract and how the vocal tract produces speech sound. Then we looked at how, cons how consonants are produced and how vowels are produced. So, we looked at different uh, production systems, the consonant from manner of articulation to voicing to the place of articulation and then we saw the three dimensional uh, space for production of the vowel. So, that is what we saw and then later on we looked at uh, some of the areas of the brain uh, which are, is responsible for producing the speech sound. So, we looked at uh, not only the Wernicke Gashwin model. Uh, but we also looked at certain other cerebral areas and how these areas they interact together to produce the speech sounds that, that, that we generate. Now, upcoming lectures we will continue this in the next lecture, but till we do that it is thank you and goodbye from here. Mm -hmm.